reading this morning is from the book of Joshua. We'll be reading from the first chapter. We'll be reading the first five verses. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Please be seated. It's good to see each one of you here this morning. We want to emphasize always for all of our people to fill out those attendance cards, and especially those visitors. We hope that you will be sure and fill those out and pass them to the end, and we'll pick those up later. But thank you for being here. I know we have a number of visitors with us, and we're thankful that you're here. We're always thankful when our regular members are here also. Today I'm going to speak on a topic that I've titled, God Never Fails. Have you ever noticed how different people react when trying times come into their lives? You see, one of the greatest needs that we have today is to be able to depend upon God and upon His power. We should have more faith. We should have more trust in Him. Many times it seems that we limit the providential care of God. He takes care of us. And Jesus tells us, He said, take no thought for your life. In essence, what He's saying is, He takes care of the lilies of the valley. He takes care of the birds of the air, and you know that He will take care of us as one of His children. He asked His disciples on the turbulent waters of the Sea of Galilee, where is your faith? O ye of little faith. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But you see, man has a great tendency to depend upon his own wisdom and upon his own intelligence rather than depending upon God. And many times we become so educated we become so self-dependent that we tend to think that we can stand by our own strength. But you know, Paul realized that he needed the strength that came from God. As he writes to the church at Philippi, in the fourth chapter there in verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Our wisdom and our intelligence certainly is limited in comparison to God. We cannot win the battles, the huge battles of life that we fight from time to time, but on our own power. We need to depend upon God. Peter tells us in 2 Peter, the first chapter, there in verse 3, it says, According to His divine power, He hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So we are to depend upon God's almighty power, His divine power to help us in these difficult times. It will sustain us as we experience the problems that occur in life. You see, God has never failed. He's never failed to keep His promises. In the ninth chapter of Genesis there, in verses 8 through 17, God gave His promise. He gave His promise to Noah and his sons that He will never destroy the earth again with a flood. 
He tells us here that the rainbow will be in the sky. It will be as a token or as a reminder of the promise that He's given us that the world will never be destroyed with water again. God also promises to make Israel a great nation. In the 12th chapter of Genesis there in verse 2, we read of this promise. He said, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, a great nation. You see, God is talking about the Jewish people. Abram's name was to be changed to Abraham, who was the father of the multitudes. You see, we all need this to transpire in our lives. As God never fails us to keep His promise, we need to keep our eye on the cross of Jesus. You see, God also promised us to save the obedient. What a great promise that He's given us. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew the 7th chapter, in verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, God has promised us to save those who render obedience to this will. The beloved Apostle John tells us in 1 John 2 and verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, he abideth forever. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7, he said to you who are troubled, he said, rest with us when the Lord Jesus, when he shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. You see, yes, God has promised us. He's promised us to save us who have obeyed that precious gospel of Jesus Christ. God is not slack concerning His promises. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering, not willing that any should be perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God keeps His promises. It has now been some 2,000 years since Jesus died on Calvary's cross. And we find that many skeptics today say that God will not come back again to take us to heaven. But you see, verse 9, it says that God is long-suffering. That means that He is patient. He has given us time to repent. He's given us time to change our lives. He wants all of us. He wants every single one of us to be saved. And that's why He sent Jesus to this earth in the flesh. In Luke the 19th chapter and verse 10, it says, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. But you see, He expects us to be obedient to His commandments. In 1 John 5 and 3, it says, For this is, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. God has never failed. He has never failed to solve the human problems that we experience in our lives. We see multitudes come to Jesus with problems. In the 10th chapter of Mark, in verse 17 through 21 and 22, we see the story of that rich young ruler and he came to Jesus with a plea. And here was his plea. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You see, Jesus told him a number of things that he should do. Jesus told him what he needed to do. He said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And take your cross and follow me. And because this man was a wealthy man, the Bible says that it grieved him and he went away. Jesus gave him. He gave him the solution to his problem. But he was not willing to accept that. The same today. People are told in God's Word what they must do to live a righteous life. But you see, many today 
like that day and time. We're not willing to listen. We see another problem that occurs that brought Jesus' attention. The problem of the quality or greatness. You remember there also in Mark the 10th chapter? Jesus, he writes this, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they had a desire to sit on his right hand and the other on his left hand in his kingdom. But there in Matthew 10, verse 43 and 44, Jesus solves this problem for them if they would just listen. He said, But so it shall not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever you will be chiefest shall be the servant of all. So you see, no one shall be elevated above another in the Lord's kingdom. No one is greater than anyone else. And so in our civil life, those who are wealthy, they usually have power and they are served by others. But Jesus says that's not so in the Lord's kingdom. In verse 31 there in Mark 10, it says many of the first shall be last and the last first. You see, those who have the deepest level, the deepest degree of faith, God will minister to those who are weaker in faith. God is able to solve the human problems that each of us have in our lives. He helps us also to solve anxiety and worry. And I know that this is useless to talk about because no one worries, I know that. But God helps us to deal with that. In Matthew the 6th chapter and verse 34, Jesus said, He said, Take therefore no thought for morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. He says, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus is saying, Don't be anxious. He's saying, Don't worry. Don't have those anxiety attacks because the sun will rise tomorrow, regardless of whether we worry or not. We need to understand that God is in control, so don't worry. And when I prepare these sermons, I know all of us as preachers, we preach it to ourselves first. We need this too. You see, God helps us to set our priorities, to get our priorities right in our lives. There has to be priorities that are established. In Luke, the 10th chapter, we have two sisters that are involved in helping Jesus. Martha, you see, was concerned about fixing food, cooking for Jesus. But Mary, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus, she was listening to His teaching. You see, Martha, she had a problem with Mary because Mary was not helping her serve. But in Luke 10 and 42, Jesus says, But one thing is needful, that Martha, listen, Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Martha was concerned. She was concerned with the physical things, but you see, Mary was concerned with the spiritual. And Jesus said, Mary, he said, you have chosen correctly. So God's Word will help us set values in our life. God has never failed to make human life better. We see this constantly in people's lives. We see Peter who at one time was arrogant, vengeful. We see where he used profanity. But yet he became a humble servant of God. Look what Paul said about those individuals that are involved in sin. In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, there beginning in verse 9 through 11, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, he said. But you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, verse 11 says, Such were some of you. 
Some of you were sinning like that, but now you have changed. You've been washed. You've been justified. And you've been sanctified. God has never failed to recompense evil. Recompense means to make a payment or to make a reward. In the sixth chapter of Romans, the 23rd verse, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans, the 12th chapter, there in verse 19, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. You see, God will take care of those that have sinned. God will take care of those that are doing harm to you. But however that sentence may be delayed, because in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, it talks about the judgment that all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ someday, and we don't know when that will be. I know in Acts the fifth chapter, he dealt with Ananias and Sapphira on the spot because they'd lied to God. But you see, there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of judgment. God has never provided for, never failed to provide for His people. He provided manna and quail in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 16, he will satisfy our needs and not our desires. He will give us the strength that we need, an opportunity to work. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, he says, if we don't work, we don't eat. You see, we know that God never fails us because He has even provided a way for us to escape damnation at the end of this life. God allowed His Son, Jesus, to go to Calvary's cross and to die and shed all of His blood that we might come in contact with that blood and have all of our sins washed away. Jesus is our Savior. He is the only source of salvation that you and I have. He was the only one that ever walked the face of this earth without sin. He was the only one that was qualified to die for us. And so we must believe in Him. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or lost. So we must believe in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God. We must be willing to repent or change the direction in our lives. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 13 and verse 3. We must be willing to confess the glorious name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the great confession that you and I must make. But yet we still have our sins. And now why tarest thou? In Acts 22 and 16. And now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We come in contact with the blood of Jesus and the watery grave of baptism. And all of our sins are washed away. And Romans 6, 3 and 4 says after that, then we will walk in newness of life. We may have some here today that have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've never obeyed, we want to give you a chance just in a few moments. But we may have, with most Christians here this morning, we may have those that do not have the the same zeal that they once had when they became a child of God. And if you want to rededicate your life, or if you want to have the prayers of the congregation for you, whatever your need might be, I hope and pray that you will respond as we stand and sing.